um, fun to put together. These trips again happened um, a few years ago. And so it was fun to get back into uh, the photos and sort through some things. Um, as Sarah said, I'm a retired pediatrician. I live in Davis, California, um, but have vacationed often in Summit County. We actually honeymooned there um, 33 years ago. Um, so my dive story um, started when my husband and I got certified in 1993, and I did it um, not, not willingly at all. Um, it was something that I uh, was never on my radar at all. I didn't even know it was on my husband's radar, but we were living in Sydney, Australia for a six month period of time. And my husband comes to me and says, I want to get scuba certified. And I said, well, okay, that's fine. Go ahead and do that. And he said, no, I want you to do it with me. And I said, no. And so, um, as most things go, I ended up doing it. Um, and it really changed our lives. Um, we have traveled places and experienced um, cultures that we never would have otherwise. We made some very, very dear friends who are um, fellow divers. Um, and so it was, it has really been a passion of ours. Um, we only dive in warm water <laughs> because I don't feel the need to get cold. Um, and before COVID, we would usually have a dive trip about once a year. Um, some of those were not very far. They would be to Hawaii um, or in the Caribbean. Uh, but we've also traveled um, longer distances to get to those places, as Sarah mentioned, that are on divers' bucket lists. Um, you have to travel a long way to find untouched reefs because every place that is close by has uh, the human population has done its done its work on it, and it's not um, in the pristine conditions that they are supposed to be. So you have to travel where not a lot of people do in order to see the the oceans as they were, let's say, a hundred years ago. Um, and it's rather sobering then to make that make the comparison. Um, one disclaimer: I am not at all a good underwater photographer. Um, I feel like sometimes I have camera malfunctions on more dives than I actually have my camera working correctly. Um, but the photos that I'm going to show you will give you some sort of an idea about the beauty and the diversity of the underwater world. And so now I'm going to start clicking. So um, the first um, area that I'm going to talk about is Raja Ampat. And it is off the coast of, it's a cluster of islands. It's off the coast of the main island of New Guinea. Um, New Guinea, oh, I can do that too. So New Guinea is situated right above Australia. This is the top part of Australia. And here's the entire island of New Guinea. And it is in two parts. Um, and the, the Western part um, is part of Indonesia. The eastern part is a country of its own called Papua New Guinea. So Raja Ampat is, is officially part of Indonesia. There are, it's an archipelago of uh, numerous small islands and those little markers that are red and white are the international dive symbol. And so this is just kind of an idea of the various places that we dove on that trip. Um, again, the trip was in 2013. Raja Ampat means the four kings. And again, it's an archipelago of small islands off the coast of West Papua. To get there, um, San Francisco to Singapore to a really interesting town called Sarong in West Papua, which um, from there we, we boarded our, our liveaboard dive boat. And I can say that we wanted to get out of Sarong as soon as we possibly could. Um, population of Raja Ampat is around 50,000. Uh, it straddles the equator um, and it has the highest underwater biodiversity in the world. 75% of all underwater species live in Raja Ampat which is pretty amazing when you think about it. These are some views of um, as we're landing in Sarong, um, dense 
covered rainforest as long as it's left the way it's supposed to be. Um, agriculture, when um, they have cleared rainforest. From the, uh, from the dock in Sarong, we were met by this small boat um, and we were taken to what we always call the mothership, which is where we spent the next 10 days. Um, these are also the boats that we actually do our diving off of. And these are kind of towed along in back of the mothership. This is the mothership. <laughs> this is the, uh, the boat is called the Aranui. It was built from Indonesian wood by Indonesian shipbuilders, many of which were still part of the crew of the ship. And the ship was about, I guess, 15 years old at the time uh, that we did this trip. Um, it is the most luxurious liveaboard boat my husband and I have been on. Um, there are more crew than there are passengers. Um, and the food out of this incredibly small galley kitchen that they have is unbelievable. Um, um, it is just a beautiful piece of um, artwork, I think. Um, this is the upper deck of the Arnui. Um, we ate outside on these tables most nights, as long as the weather um, permitted. We lounge in between dives. One of the cabins. Now we go underwater. Um, the first set of pictures are what I would call the, the aquarium fish. So these are very colorful, um, small to rather good size fish that we saw in Raja Ampat um, of all shapes and size and colors. Um, this is an angelfish. The markings on this fish are incredible. Um, it looks like an artist would ha have had to have painted individually all that blue around the fish's mouth because it is so intricate. Starfish come in all sizes, shapes, and colors. Um, this one was probably as big as my hand. We have seen on e other dive trips um, starfish with a diameter from one end of one arm to the op to the end of the opposite arm, about eight feet. So it's incredible. It's an incredibly diverse animal. This is a little puffer fish. We think these guys are really cute. Um, it's kind of a cuteness though that only a mother could love. Um, they only puff when they have to. Um, and you don't want, as a diver, you don't want to make them puff. Um, that means they're stressed. Um, we have actually had a puffer, puffer fish in an aquarium at our home. And when on the few times that the fish did puff afterwards, he would have to retreat into a little kind of hidden area for a couple of hours to, to recover. So um, again, that's not something that you as a diver want to make them do because it is quite stressful for them. Bad picture of one of my favorite fish. This is a clown trigger fish. Um, the, the pattern on this fish is so eye-catching. It's one of those oddities in nature that um, this fish is so visible um, that it is in some way um, a deterrent for um, a, a, an attacker. Um, other fish do it the other way. They make themselves camouflage to look like everything else, but this guy definitely does not. A underwater photographer's favorite subject are clownfish because they stay still. Um, and um, these guys uh, live as Nemo taught almost everybody um, that they live in these anemones, the anemones do are stinging and they have a toxin, but they are not toxic to the clownfish. Um, and so the clownfish helps to protect the anemone and the anemone helps to protect the clownfish. Here's a little guy who is, makes his home 
um, sometimes on the outside, but sometimes he will go inside those holes that you see. This is a, a type of a sponge that he's sitting on. And so at times you'll see just his little eyes and his little mouth coming out from the top of those, um, of those little circular areas. They're very cute. Also, they kind of stay still for you as a photographer also. These are two of my husband, my favorites. These are called six banded angel fish. These two particular individuals were probably about 18 inches um, long and about 12 to 14 inches um, from top to bottom. Um, they get very large in some of these places where they don't have a lot of predators. Um, you can see that neon blue line surrounding them and the neon blue dots on their tail. Absolutely beautiful creatures. Here's one of our camouflage guys. So this is um, um, a fish that tends to be able to, like an octopus, turn the colors of its surroundings. So to orient, I have showed you where the eye is and the mouth. The fish is facing to the right. Um, and um, they, um, the name of the fish is a scorpion fish, and they are, um, they do have poison that can be quite serious. So you, as a diver, want to make sure that before you touch something, which you shouldn't touch much anyway, but if you do have to study yourself, look before you touch because you don't want to put your hand on one of these guys. Um, this is dizzying and hopefully not seizure inducing to anybody, but this is a type of puffer fish. Um, but he is big and bulbous like this. He is not currently puffed as we see him here, even though he looks again, like a big um, balloon. Um, the patterns on these guys are again, incredibly intricate, beautiful fish. This guy is called a batfish. He also goes by several different names. He's in the process of being cleaned by that little blue cleaner fish that you see on his forehead. Um, these guys are really fun. Um, they sometimes are solitary and sometimes they're in a school. Um, they are very, very curious about divers. And if you, as a diver, see one of these guys at the beginning of your dive, and you're taking your time and swimming along a reef, you may look over your shoulder and this guy may be right behind you, following you along um, as the dive goes on. Um, you can make eye contact with them. They look at you. They don't want to touch you, but they are very curious and want to hang out with you. They want to see what you're doing. Um, this is my husband on the other side of a huge bunch of fish. The, the size of schools of fish that we saw in Raja Ampat are unlike anything we've ever seen around the world. Literally in one view, you are seeing thousands of fish. Um, if you go to the Caribbean, um, you will see schools of fish, but never in the numbers that we have seen in Indonesia and Papua New Guinea. Another example of how many fish can be in one small area. Um, the fish in the middle that are kind of see-through, they have a black band around them. Those are a type of cardinal fish. Um, the yellow fish are yellow damsels. Um, and they all kind of cohabitate on this kind of coral. Um, what happens if they get spooked is they all immediately um, through communication that no one can understand, go down in between these fingers of coral to where you can't see them. And then if you pause for a while and, and be patient, then they come on back, back up and, and out again. A few shots from um, above the water. Um, again, there are um, lots of islands in the area of Raja Ampat. Most are uninhabited and most are of small size, kind of like this. This boat that you see here, we didn't see very many other boats on our trip, but um, we only saw one other boat that was a diving boat. And the rest of them, our crew told us, were mostly wealthy yacht 
owners that came from around the world to just sail around um, this very undisturbed area. This is a pretty common thing that you'll see in that part of the world where over years, the underside of a rock formation has just been eroded away. So it looks almost like a mushroom um, and that will keep ongoing until the rock eventually falls into the water when its base is gone. I always like these things in nature because it looks like, you know, where, where could this plant get nutrients out of that rock? But just like you see, you know, in the mountains, um, you, you, that one tree coming out of, you know, the side of solid granite. Um, I always like those things. Life comes from everywhere. We took a hike one day and went up quite high and gave us this amazing view of, uh, of the waters. You can see our, our mothership there in the foreground. Um, but the, the beautiful, um, mysterious rainforest covered um, islands, just beautiful. And you don't have to go to the supermarket to get orchids there, they grow. <laughs> Another view of the, from up on high. Again, this is what this area of the world is supposed to look like. It's supposed to be covered um, with, you know, first growth rainforest. The crew was a blast. Um, you can, they always had a smile on their face. Um, always ready with your correct coffee order in the morning. Um, but one night, we were parked in this little cove. The water was very smooth. And one of the crew got a surfboard and got a ski rope. And of course, this is not in the US. There is no life jacket on that gentleman, um, but pulled himself up on the surfboard and basically water skied. And they were having a blast. Now back underwater. So this is gonna be a series of creatures that are not really your aquarium type fish. This is a moray eel. Um, he is one of the animals that has a scary look. Um, I always say that people are kind of afraid of, of eels and they're afraid of sharks because they look like they're unhappy or mean, uh, as opposed to dolphins who are always smiling. And so it's really easy to like dolphins. Um, but morays are very interesting creatures. They spend most of their days um, in the rocks. Um, they come out hunting at night. They have very poor vision. They hunt by their sense of smell. Um, but when you're lucky enough to see a moray um, out swimming at night, they are just beautiful, beautiful creatures. Definitely made, made for cruising the reef. This is... Um, called a leaf scorpion fish. And again, for orientation, I have an arrow pointing to where the eye is and where the pectoral fin is. So the fish is kind of facing to the right, but almost away from us. Um, these fish, the way you see him on this piece of coral is the way that they spend most of their time. They don't move much at all. In fact, they kind of sway back and forth with the currents. So that's why they're called the leaf scorpion fish. It kind of, they look very much like leaves. And unless you're an experienced diver enough to know what you're looking for, your eye won't pick them out. They come in all different colors. Um, um, they um, hunt by stealth. Um, they stay basically still until their prey comes by and with a very rapid action, um, they, they get their, their meal and go back and sit down just like they were again. This is a cute little lobster. Um, in the Caribbean, you see lobsters that are up to, you know, two and a half, three feet long. This little guy is no more than probably six inches, but his coloration is really beautiful. And he thinks he's really fierce. He thinks he's one of those two and a half or three feet long lobsters. And he really isn't, but he, he moves his, his claws around his antennae around like he is. Another strange, but beautiful creature. This is a, um, a type of, um, um, sea star basically, um, neon colored, 
Um, that purple is exactly how you see it. It's got neon blue on it too. Um, you'll see one of these maybe. And then if you look around, you'll usually see many, many more. They tend to be um, in large clusters for reasons that I don't understand um, other than they don't move around very much. So once they reproduce, they kind of stay, but um, absolutely beautiful. Um, not a great picture again, but to show you the size and beauty of some of the sea fans that are uh, in the ocean, um, they look like a intricate lace fan. They can be um, the size of your palm. They can be um, 12 feet from side to side. Usually on these trips, we go to a village, we make a little village visit. Um, usually we bring some stuff for the kids, whether it be candy or crayons or something like that. And the kids are always the first ones to come out and hang out with us and see what we've brought them. Um, always willing to have their pictures taken as well. Isn't she cute? Um, Yes, they have a large um, dish, so they too can have a TV <laughs> in the village and they can, they're hooked up to the world. It takes a village to raise a child and that's ha definitely how these, uh, in this part of the world, how, how it works. The children are kind of all communal, moms, grandmas, aunts, um, um, you know, everybody watches out for all the little ones. And yes, Manchester United is universal. The kids are one with the water. They're in the water all the time. They're very adept swimmers. Um, um, it's been part of their life since they were born. It's nice to see. Back under the water for a few bigger things. Um, one of my favorites, this is a manta ray. Again, not a very good picture. Mantas are different from stingrays. They do not sting. Um, um, they are, they were called devil rays um, um, back in the day before people knew, knew about them just because they were so large. Um, but they're filter feeders like humpback whales. So um, they don't have any teeth. They can't bite you. They don't want to bite you. Um, they are anywhere from six feet to, in some places around the world, 12 feet in wingspan. Um, um, they are absolutely gorgeous creatures. They, they do ballet underwater. There's the underside of a manta. His eyes are on either side of those pedicles, which no one exactly knows what those pedicles really do. Some people say, think they swoop the food into their mouth. Um, some people say it's part of their steering mechanism. They can curl them up or fold them down. Um, you can also, also see on the underside of this guy um, some various spots. And this is how researchers tell them apart. Um, every manta has its own distinguishable pattern of spots and um, the researchers in a certain area will get to know individuals um, by their spots. This is a type of a shark. He's called a wobegong and he spends most of his time doing just what you're seeing him here. He lays flat out on a piece of coral <clears throat> and looks like he's asleep. This guy is probably from front to back and you can't see his tail because it's underneath um, another layer of coral. He's probably um, six or seven feet long. He has these very interesting things that rim um, his mouth, they're called barbels. And um, they're part of his sensory mechanism. They, they feel and they touch, but they give him a very uh, prehistoric look. Um, interesting creatures. Now we come to the small guys. These uh, are a series of pictures of animals that are called nudibranchs. Nudibranchs are some of the most colorful things that you'll see in the underwater world. Um, they're... Um, they all have appendages, like those curly things that you see in the middle of his body. Um, those are its lungs. 
So they have external lungs. Um, and um, no one knows really why this, why that happened in these creatures. Um, but there are um, some other creatures that are also very colorful that are called flatworms, which don't have th those external lung appendages. So this is my green and black guy. We always kind of talk about them because we never know their scientific names. Some of my dive friends do, but I don't. So these are the green and black ones. There's a white bumpy one. That guy, he's probably maybe three inches in length. I like him. He looks like he definitely has horns. This is more of a flatworm. Um, you'll notice there aren't those frilly appendages on him, um, but he's also very, very colorful. There's his appendages. This is just a picture that I really, really like. Um, this is, we're diving um, underneath a wharf and you can see all the pilings from the wharf have all become encrusted, um, almost like a shipwreck with all kinds of wonderful living creatures. Um, but I love how the sun rays are coming through that, that photo. We always end each portion with a, the obligatory sunset picture. It's one of the best. So that was our experience in um, Raja Ampat. So we really got the bug to come back to that general area um, because of the diversity. Um, we decided about two years, probably in 2014, that we wanted to go to Papua New Guinea. Um, I had a personal interest in it because my dad spent um, between two and three years in Papua New Guinea during World War II. And he was really into photography at the time. And so we have stacks and stacks of black and white eight by 10 photos of natives and land forms and um, boats and arts and crafts and things that he took. And so it's always been kind of interesting to me. Um, but the diving there is superb. Um, so on this trip, um, we traveled actually through Australia to get um, to Papua New Guinea. Uh, we flew into um, um, we, we flew into Sydney. Then we flew from Sydney to Port Moresby, which you'll see on the map there, which is the capital of um, Papua New Guinea. We then took another commuter flight. Um, which took us over to Milne Bay. Uh, in Milne Bay, we stayed on in a in a resort on land and took day boats out to our dive sites. We did that for about five days. Then the second part of that trip, we flew back to Port Moresby and then flew up to Rabul, which is on the island of New Britain, and that's where Kimby Bay is. And we took a boat from Kimby. Um, and were on a liveaboard boat for a week and did areas around in the Bismarck Sea. So we had two kind of separate, um, but dive-wise very similar um, uh, experiences in New Guinea. Um, so again, it's the Eastern half of the island of New Guinea. Um, from World War I, to 1975, uh, Papua New Guinea was administered by Australia. So it was part of the Commonwealth um, that it gave its, its independence in 1975. It has mostly a rural population of around 8 million. But one of the things that is absolutely amazing is there are 851 distinct languages that are spoken in a population of 8 million people. Um, many settlements in the highlands are only accessed by, on foot or by air. There are no roads. Um, there are still many settlements that um, have only limited exposure to white man, as I'll call them. The, um, one of the problems in Papua New Guinea is it's very rich in natural resources, but unfortunately for the 
the native population, most of those resources are um, mined and um, um, profited by foreign countries. Um, and that goes back to kind of the colonial times and who, who was there and who had settlements there and who had money to put into um, these mining um, operations. Um, the government is also not a particularly stable government and um, is often um, talked about in the media of as accepting bribes from these mining companies in order for them to still do business. And so the money does not trickle down to the population and it is one of the world's um, poorest countries. Um, what might look like a road is not, it's a river. Um, this is flying in and um, you can see a little bit of the topography. I have another photo in a second that will show more of the, um, how mountainous this country actually is. Another view of another river. And this shows the, the highlands. It was kind of reminiscent to me of some places in Hawaii, on Maui and Kauai, um, where um, the mountains are high, the crevices are deep, but it's covered with this lush rainforest. This I included because this is what you don't want to see in this part of the world, but what we're seeing more and more. So on the bottom part of the picture, you can see these very um, um, linear lines of palm trees. Um, these are um, these were planted to, to harvest palm oil, which is used in various foods and other products. Um, um, acres and acres and acres of rainforest in this part of the world have been um, uh, cleared in order to place palm oil palm trees in. Um, our family, because this is so disturbing to us, basically is a label reading for palm oil as much as we can because we don't want to continue to support um, um, these industries, um, which are really, really taking habitat um, from, the, from the rainforest. This is... Um, the view from the water of the resort that we stayed in the Milne Bay area, it was, um, it was fairly rustic, um, but they did a nice job of, you know, getting supplies in a country that it's very hard to get things that Westerners um, would kind of expect. Back down underwater, most most folks have seen a picture of one of these guys from time to time. These are lionfish. They come in all different colors from bright orangey red to very dark, almost black. Um, they are beautiful creatures um, with a, the array of spines that they have. They are poisonous, um, um, but beautiful creatures underwater. Um, they've gotten most of their publicity recently um, in a bad way because they were introduced into the Caribbean where they are not a native species and they have no predators there. So they are changing the reef ecosystem in uh, the Caribbean in a big way. Um, and people think that that started with the pet trade, that people had the lionfish in their aquariums and they didn't want their aquariums anymore. So they uh, dumped their fish into the Caribbean and they were very successful at reproducing. And now it's a huge problem. Clownfish again, they stand still. So I take a photo of them. It's hard not to, because they're really cute. These are more of the batfish that I said were the curious guys that would follow you along. This is of them happening to be in a school. Um, and th this is more unusual. Um, but they are all about the size of a large dinner plate um, and about um, as narrow a fish as you can possibly imagine. This is an interesting picture to me because it shows that anemone that the clownfish live in when it's not all flat on the reef. So the anemone for 
for some reasons, probably stress, can fold itself up and it looks like a bowl of of noodles, of spaghetti noodles. Um, the clownfish don't mind this. They just hang out in the little part of the anemone that's, that's shown. But these big balls, basically, or bowls, um, they can be this color of orangey red. They can be bright, bright blue. Um, um, and again, after a while, this anemone will relax. It will unfold itself and become like a rug back on the reef again. This is one of those scorpion fish again, which you don't want to put your hand on. Um, um, he is facing to the right and um, looks pretty much like the reef that is surrounding him. This guy I like he because he's well named. He's again, bad picture quality, but he's called Sweet Lips and you can tell why. He's getting cleaned by two little cleaner fish right there. Um, but they, um, this whole species, and there are several different versions of them, but they all have these amazingly large lips. This, I, I love this picture, even though it's not a good photograph, but it is of a school, circling school of Barracuda. Um, the number of fish in this school was in the thousands. And they are not really actively hunting, but they are, are making this, this swirling school um, that is just an underwater amazement to see. Here's our little land portion on this trip. We went to um, a primary school um, and next to the primary school was also a small medical clinic. This is the medical clinic. You'll see behind the woman who's the local healthcare worker. He says, I'm Mr. Condom. Um, and they, as many parts of the developing world have had trouble um, um, with communicating with people about HIV and AIDS. Um, so they're doing it in cartoon form there. Um, there's a door just to the left of Mr. Condom and it says M ward that stands for maternity ward. And there was a woman in there sitting on the floor who, um, had just delivered a baby the night before, and she was sitting nursing the baby and she'll go back to, um, her village later that day. This is the school. Um, this is a very typical um, outrigger canoe that the natives would fish from. Um, most of the villages are subsistence livers. The men fish, the women and children tend to gardens that are up, up the mountain a bit from the sea level. Um, I asked one of our guides one time, I said, so, you know, I see all these guys out fishing in the morning. I said, what do you do if you don't catch anything? And he says, you go out again. So um, uh, basically they have, they, th their, the protein part of their diet is fish and then wild boar or domesticated pigs of which there are numerous. Um, these canoes are all made out of the local trees. Um, when we were on the boat portion of our trip, Every couple of days, uh, we would go in an area where there was a local village and they would bring out produce from their farm to sell to the boat. So we would have fresh produce from, um, from these families who came out to meet us in their boats. Um, and it, it, it was all a little different than what we were used to. Um, you wouldn't find most of what is there at the Safeway, um, but it was all deliciously fresh and the chef prepared it beautifully. Here's a dad with his two little ones in his boat. This was um, on our way back in from uh, an afternoon of diving and one of our crew members took out a single monofilament fishing line, put a little um, a small fish on a hook on the end no rod, no reel, just his hands. And um, he ended up with that. And that was gonna be dinner for his family that night. 
pigs. Again, some domesticated, some wild. Um, I wish this picture was better color. Um, it just starts to show the enormity of the number of fish um, that were on the reefs that we saw in Papua New Guinea. Um, literally thousands of fish in your, in your view. Sometimes if there was something bigger, it's like you wanted the little fish to get out of the way so you could see the bigger thing. Mm -hmm. Interesting creatures, they look like plants, but they're actually animals. These are called crinoids and they, um, they, can, um, they can actually walk on these multiple arms that they have. Usually they're hanging on to something like you see here, but especially in the late afternoon, they will start marching and it's very eerie to watch them because they don't really have a head or anything like that. It just looks like this plant is walking. One of my favorite underwater creatures, this is a cuttlefish. It's a relative of an octopus. Um, to orient you, his, um, his face and his tentacles are to the right and the rest of his body is back and to the left. Um, he can make his skin as flat and shiny as he wants. He can also make it um, bumpy like this guy is right now. He can change color from as white as he is to um, almost black as night and any color in between. Um, they have eight tentacles, um, uh, similar again to an octopus. Um, they use their tentacles as arms to feed. They also use their tentacles as arms to place eggs. And we have witnessed that, which is an amazing thing to watch the female place her eggs with her tentacles into the, into the rock protection um, where she'll, she'll keep an eye on them until they hatch. Um, absolutely magnificent creatures. One dive in Papua New Guinea, um, there were 12 of these in our line of sight. Um, it was just an incredible experience. More little guys. This is not a little guy. This is called a sea cucumber. Um, there are many different kinds, but he's kind of interesting because he's red and white and very spiky. Um, native populations eat these. Um, they are thought to have aphrodisiac qualities. Um, I don't think I'd care for any. This is a crab who is alarmed <laughs> and, and astonished, um, but he's kind of funny. His, his arms are up in defense. This is called a frogfish. Again, a, a master of disguise. He's actually facing us. I have um, marked where his mouth and his eye are. He feeds like the other, that, that leaf scorpion fish that we talked to about. Um, he stays in one place until he sees something and then snap um, and he's got his prey. Those all, these also come in every color of the rainbow. Another nudibranch with his um, gills on the outside with his lungs on the outside. The friendly neighborhood turtle. This turtle is very, very used to our boats, divers, and um, has made kind of a friendship with, with one of the dive masters. Um, he followed us between one dive site to another one morning, and he unfortunately kind of expects to be fed. So my friend Tina has a piece of coral that a piece of sponge, excuse me, that she's going to be, be feeding to him. Um, very curious, very in your face. Um, there, there's been too much human interaction with him to make him this way, which is kind of sad. But on the other hand, it's quite entertaining to have a turtle just swim next to you because he wants to be there. Um, bad photo of a really amazingly large sponge. This is our dive master who is basically inside um, tank and all. Um, an extremely large sponge. Always have to show sharks. Um, we love diving with sharks. We've never been fearful of them. Um, we know what kind we're diving with and what is expected in an area. 
Um, they are um, masters of the ocean um, and they are beautiful, beautiful to watch. Um, there are some types of sharks that you wouldn't get in the water with. Um, and you and you have to understand that you're in their territory. Um, but I, I love dives where we're seeing sharks. It's exciting, they're beautiful. Um, and another sunset to end up the Papua New Guinea portion. And with that, that's my last slide. Cost and flight time. Cost and flight time. Um, these trips are not.